August 6, 2000. Professional athletes, young, strong, invincible, and human like the rest of us. We thought, you know, DT would be here forever, at least a couple more, you know, along with us, but all of a sudden he's gone. And uh, that's the cruel part of it, how quickly, how quickly it happened. Bo is going to take his first free throw left-handed in honor of his friend, Hank Gabbard. This week on Outside the Lines, facing the future, how teams and individuals address the passing of teammates. Outside the Lines is presented by 1-800-CALL-ATT. Joining us from ESPN Studios and sitting in for Bob Lee, Mark Schwartz. Every time the Charlotte Hornets leave practice, they pass the spot where Bobby Fills was killed in a car crash. Each lap NASCAR drivers take around New Hampshire International Speedway, they must negotiate the very turn around which Adam Petty and Kenny Irwin each lost their lives. Now, the Kansas City Chiefs have returned to a locker room void of the uplifting banter from the team's biggest personality, Derek Thomas. The Oakland Raiders camp is a more somber setting also in the absence of Eric Turner. When Irwin died in New Hampshire, qualifying continued within an hour after the track was cleared. Phils died on a Wednesday. Two days after that, the Hornets were on the floor battling the Knicks without him. Is that appropriate? That's debatable, but it is harsh reality. As Charlotte coach Paul Silas put it, the players can rally around each other or else we can disintegrate. Athletes have performed remarkably in the face of crushing tragedy. A year ago, the Houston Comets claimed their third consecutive WNBA championship days after point guard Kim Parrott succumbed to cancer. We'll speak with Parrott's coach later in this program, but first, Shelly Smith and her report on how the Chiefs and Raiders are coping without Derek Thomas and Eric Turner. Derek Thomas was a raging force with the Kansas City Chiefs for 11 seasons. The nine-time Pro Bowler was the cornerstone of the team. When training camp began this season, the Chiefs were reminded almost immediately that he was gone. On the airplane, I think uh, you always see Derek coming in, you know, making a little noise so you know that he's coming. He would always come to me and say, I, I look better than you do today. And this year when we went to camp and I got on that airplane, uh, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, this is it. This is the end. For the Oakland Raiders, who lost defensive back Eric Turner to cancer in May, the reminders were more subtle. You know, you see someone who may have the same uh, type build as Eric, and it's kind of like, that's Eric. Ah, you know what I'm saying? You got to get back to reality and, and, and realize that he's not around anymore. When certain things go down, when certain things occur, when we're in a meeting and someone says certain things, you wait for that reply that he would make, or you wait for something that he would do. Losing a teammate, especially a close teammate, is as traumatic to many as losing a relative. For some, it is even more so because of the dynamic of what they do. Our occupation is a little different from 99% of the rest of the world because although he's, you know, an, another uh, uh, guy at, at the workplace, we spend nine hours a day for, with each other for seven months, you know, and it's like, uh, it, it's almost closer than family sometimes. It's almost like, you know, you have this brick wall and to lose a brick is a really big thing. And the better the brick, most likely it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. And, you know, he is one of our more valuable bricks. So, you know, you have a hole somewhere in the middle of the wall and that's, that's big. There is a void, there's a vacuum for them. So they have a problem in being able to readjust emotionally to the absence of that person some instances the athlete will experience a reverie or a, a daydreaming about how that person was there with them and they may be emotionally caught up in that reverie and that thinking about them some of the players didn't want to face it initially Donnie Edwards didn't want to period and uh, didn't want to accept it Edwards wasn't alone in his heavy sorrow over losing Thomas the team's emotional leader we went out there for the first time to stretch as a team um, it was very, very quiet. There wasn't a guy saying a single word out there. And usually the first day you're excited to be out there and, and getting ready for the season and getting going, but it was, there was dead silent out there. Chiefs coach Gunther Cunningham was close to Thomas as well. 
and was struggling with his own feelings. Cunningham had to balance his pain with that of his players. I had a friend who was in uh, psychiatry who I asked, uh, you know, these are my feelings. How do you convey that to the team and how do you control the team? And, and he says, hey, share your feelings with those guys. And they see a 54-year-old guy shedding tears and, and uh, they need to see that. It was really tough. I think it really tested me uh, probably to my limits um, to handle the football team. Gunther had to be the strong guy throughout the whole thing and he shared about how there was times, you know, it got too much for him. And he had to, you know, release some of the some of the emotions he had. Pro Bowl cornerback James Hasty had his own way of coping. The only way I could really deal with it was just crying, you know. I, all I did was cry pretty much for the most part. For him, getting back on the field and being physical was cathartic. I think that's kind of helped uh, because there'll be times where I might take an extra shot at a receiver or and, you know, again, it's something I'm just getting it all out. You know, I'm getting it out, my, getting off my shoulders, and uh, I'm moving on. But, uh, but the bottom line is I'm not going to forget, you know, and I'm going to play. Uh, every, every time I take a step out on that field, I'm going to play with that, mind, with that focus in mind is that basically I'm playing for my guy. Cunningham urged his team to embrace that concept, to think about Thomas when they stepped on the field. For a second, I stopped to think, you know, I hear Derek in my ear. Come on, amigo. Come on, amigo. He's always around. Like, his spirit is still alive around the team, and it really makes me smile sometimes. Does that help? It, yeah, yeah, it does. You know, instead of, like, thinking about, you know, you know, that we lost him, you also think about, like, how Derek was and how funny he was and, you know, little things that he'd do. Like, it just makes you laugh. The Raiders, like the Chiefs, are still coming to grips with their loss, remembering Turner in different ways. I really don't try to talk about it too much, you know, though. I kind of, you know, you might not notice it, uh, people may not notice it, but I, I kind of take it kind of hard. But um, when the conversation comes up, you know, about Eric, I just kind of, you know, say his name and then just, you know, just kind of try to go into another conversation. I, I try not to dwell on it. We were on the sidelines and during practice, it was a, <clears throat> a drill where two people would grab the ball with one hand and see who could snatch it out of the other person's hand. And uh, that was an ongoing battle between... Eric Turner, Eric Allen, Charles Woodson, and myself, and, um, you know, other players participated in and out, but it came down more or less to E.T., um, E.A., and Wood, and myself. Have you guys done it yet, this training camp? No, we haven't done it once. Think you will? I don't know. Chief management recognizes that Thomas's loss goes beyond the game. It will be difficult when we don't announce number 58. But uh, we'll get through it. Both teams know that grieving is a process, that such profound pain cannot be easily dismissed or forgotten. The initial feelings of shock and despair may have passed, but there will be a lot of tough times ahead. For Outside the Lines, I'm Shelley Smith. In a moment, we discuss how athletes work through death with a NASCAR driver, an athletic counselor, and a coach who has steered a team through the loss of its floor leader. Outside the Lines is presented by 1-800-CALL-ATT for collect calls. In a world where a collect call can cost you dearly, two warriors show the way. 1-800-CALL-ATT presents Diamond Dragons. The rates are low, but the action is sky high with... 1-800-CALL-ATT! I'm very clever, but perhaps you forgot. Light of the mongoose. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll dial. 1-800-C-A-L-L-E-T-T. You have saved big bucks, my son. The student has become the teacher. 1-800-CALL-ATT. My phone's everywhere. Inside is unlimited strength and power. It builds confidence and reshapes your body. It can change everything. This is Bowflex, an entire gym and one easy-to-use machine. 
so powerful, it delivers over 60 Health Club quality exercises with up to 410 pounds of resistance, all in the convenience of your own home. Strength training with Bowflex is so effective that we guarantee you'll get the results you want in six weeks or less. And you can own one with no money down and payments as low as $33 per month. Bowflex is real. The results are real. The question is, are you ready for Bowflex? For a free video and brochure, call or go online at bowflexdirect.com. Do the research, listen to real customers, then place your order online and get started. Bowflex. Who said change isn't easy? Welcome back to Outside the Lines. Our topic, Facing the Future. How teams and individuals cope with the passing of teammates. And joining us from Charlotte, North Carolina, Winston Cup driver Jeffrey Bodine, voted one of NASCAR's 50 greatest drivers. From Chicago, Dana London, director of a nonprofit group that helps athletes focus on their profession while navigating the challenges of personal and family issues. And from Sacramento, California, Van Chancellor, three-time WNBA Coach of the Year, who has led the Houston Comets to three consecutive WNBA championships. And while we are so glad to have all three of you with us this morning, we are particularly glad to have Jeffrey Bodine with us because of something you experienced in February, Jeffrey, at Daytona during a truck event. And if we could, with no further delay, let us take a look at a near-death experience for Jeffrey Bodine on the track this February. Look out, we got trouble. This is gonna hurt. Uh-oh, oh my. Oh my. Keep your fingers crossed. Now, Jeffrey, as close as you came to not being here, how disturbing was that? And do you think about how close that call was? I really do. Uh, yeah, that was a uh, unsurvivable accident. Uh, but I did survive it. And just through the, the grace of God, he, he saved me that day. And, you know, I, I understand that. And uh, watching that uh, video, and I actually have the remains uh, of what you saw there uh, that was on a racetrack in my shop and you know I go in there and look at that and yeah it bothers me uh, knowing that I came so close to uh, to dying but it also makes me feel really good knowing that uh, I was saved and I did survive that accident and you know that God did bless me that day so uh, it, it's kind of uh, a twofold thing uh, yeah it was it's terrible it's kind of scary to watch again but uh, I'm here, and I, I did survive it, and, you know, I was blessed in many ways. I mean, I can still drive a race car. I just came back from Indy uh, yesterday, and, you know, so I, I, it's, it's really amazing that uh, I did survive, and it's amazing that I'm able to drive uh, race cars again. Jeffrey, does NASCAR handle this issue sensitively enough? We pointed out earlier that Adam Petty and Kenny Irwin died in practice laps, and within an hour, they were back on the track. Is that appropriate? Well, you know, I, we all have our own opinions, but I really think it is. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's hard. I'm not going to tell you it, it's easy to go out there. And uh, in auto racing, you know, we can see skid marks. We can see uh, marks in the wall where, where the car made an impact. So we're constantly reminded of, of what happened. And it's very hard to go back down the racetrack. And uh, like at Loudoun, we had to go out there and, and qualify and and get ready for a race and every time I went into turn three I, you know I was reminded uh, that that Kenny uh, lost his life right there and you know but I, I think it's appropriate because uh, that that way we can uh, we can honor whoever we lost uh, we can uh, show our respect uh, the race fans can do that by coming to the track and uh, the drivers we all talk about it we remember the person uh, so I don't think it's a bad thing that we the show continues. Uh, it's always been that way in, in auto racing and other types of uh, sporting events. And uh, I think it, it's uh, the right thing to do. It gives us all time to get together and, and remember that person and, and grieve. And uh, you know the winner, whoever it might be, gets in victory lane, he dedicates the race to that person. I mean, a lot of really good things occur, even though it's 
really only a day or hours after uh, their their death, uh, it's still a, a good positive time for everyone. Jeffrey, you're involved in an individual sport. Let's talk to Van Chancellor, who is involved in a team sport, the WNBA. Coach, you lost Kim Parrott, your point guard. Uh, she battled cancer for six months before finally succumbing. But even though she battled it, was that enough time for your team to adjust and prepare for the shock and pain of the news? It was not. It was just very tough. When you keep when when you have cancer and you're sick, you keep thinking that person's gonna get well. But she never did, and when she passed away, that was the toughest four or five hours I've ever had to deal with the team. We were in a hotel in Los Angeles, California. That's right, and you had to play a game 24 hours after you got news of her death. Was that right? Should the WNBA have said, you don't have to do this? You don't even have to make this trip? Well, let me tell you, that's the toughest call we've ever had, as, I, I think, as a coach. The WNBA talked to us, and we had an opportunity to either play or to cancel, but her family wanted us to play in her memory, and, and, and we decided because it had playoff implications, we didn't want to sit around in a motel room and mope. We played the game the next day. It was the hardest time getting them on the floor. As I look back, is it right or wrong? I can't answer that. Dana London, you have worked extensively with both individual and team sports athletes. What is unique to athletes as far as the way they are forced to confront the death of a co-worker? Well, I think that the, the main thing that we have to address is that the death of a teammate, it, it's, it's not a sports issue. It's a human issue. And as long as we're not expecting these teammates, uh, male and female, to go out and and uh, not be affected. You know, I, I think that sometimes we we put uh, we do a tribute before the start of a game or a black band or numbers on a shoe, and expect that the players cannot can just go on and, and act like nothing else happened. I, I think that we just have to have a, the compassion and get a little bit beyond the That's actual not. sport. We're going to take a short break. We will return with our guests, Jeffrey Bodine, Dana London, and Van Chancellor, as Outside the Lines continues right after this. Hot Summer Comedies are cool this month on Dish on Demand. Two best friends agree to box against each other in a fight that may resurrect a winner's career. It's play it to the bone. Then a legendary undercover agent starts to crack while he tries to put together a big bust. It's gun shy. And hoping to avoid an inner city thug, a young man moves to the suburbs where he finds life is just as adventurous. It's next Friday. Watch Channel 500 for movie previews and use your remote to order. Want to know how it ends? Gotta know where. And we're back with former Daytona 500 winner Jeffrey Bodine, Dana London, and Houston Comets coach Van Chancellor. Eight years ago, a football player by the name of Jerome Brown died in a car accident. He was a Philadelphia Eagle. His teammate on that team, Mike Golick, now works for ESPN. Mike told us that it was very awkward in some ways that the Eagles tried to use Jerome Brown's death as a rallying point throughout the season. They set up his locker both at home and on the road. Here's Mike Golick. Very superficially, you could say, oh, you know, this happened, let's use this, you know, let's, let's go off this emotion. But I almost sit there and think about it sometimes, and I think to myself, my God, I'm using the death of a friend of mine to pump me up for a game. You know, sometimes it seems almost, you know, non-real. You know, like, I, I can't do that. You know, that, that's, that's not right. Dana London, people do have various reactions to the death of a loved one or a teammate. What is the right way for a team to conduct business after the death of a prominent member of its community? I think that we have to do it at least respectfully. You know, I think that we, we kind of expect the athletes to, just as was stated in the piece, just kind of remove themselves, rally around, and act as though nothing happened. And I, I don't think that that's really feasible. When things happen in our school system, uh, a kid brings a gun to school, we have, I think, the grief counselors converge upon the school and, and they, they address each and every kid and if you have nightmares about it, if you have thoughts about it. And so I think that we need to at least 
have uh, removed ourselves from the schedule. I mean, these, these players are expected to grieve on schedule, and it's just not feasible. And, and so if, if a guy is having a bad day, we have to at least let him have a bad day. You know, we, you know, most of us take off if, we, if we're grieving. Uh, these guys don't have that flexibility. I, so I think that a little bit more uh, of an approach, a personal approach, has to be taken. And Van, I think you, having been through that with Kim Farratt, know as well as anybody what the dynamic is with a team. Cynthia Cooper was Kim Farratt's best friend and also your best player. We can look at something Cynthia Cooper wrote in the month of May, and she, she said that she had a difficult time. It took her a month and a half after the season ended to realize that she was in trouble because she had taught herself not to grieve or mourn the deaths of Kim or of her mother. And it wasn't until January that she started the full-fledged healing process. What she learned is she had to not try to put things behind her, but just in the proper perspective. You were her coach, you were also a mentor of sorts. Which one did you pay more attention to, the player or the person? I don't think there's any doubt. As I listen to this show, I thought the comments in our whole organization, we put our players first as human beings. We never even thought about whether we won or lost. All we were concerned about was how they were reacting to this death, how, how they felt. We came together as a human beings. Some people said we came together and won because of Kim. We came together because of our love and respect for her and for each other. And that's what we, we got through this thing because of our love for each other as human beings, not necessarily as basketball players. You what know, advice and, and would, would you give to, to coaches Gunther Cunningham of the Chiefs or John Gruden of the Raiders as they deal with the deaths this fall of Derek Thomas and Eric Turner? I don't have any doubt. I think you have to show your emotions, how you felt about the player, how you felt about that situation. I think as a coach, you have to be a human being first because you had, I cried I, every time that this thing came up. Yes, I did cry about it. But let me say this, I love Kim Parrott. I loved her family. And I think as these coaches, they had to, they had to address this issue. They had to admit it. You go to practice, and there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I miss Kim today, because you really do. I still miss Kim. But, Coach, I think you have to acknowledge the fact, even on a, even on a minor level, that women and men deal with grief differently. No question in and, my mind about that. And so I think that society holds men so, you know, so accountable to be in, in complete control of every emotion that it's a lot more difficult for them to express those feelings. I mean, you know, Cynthia Cooper is an, is, a, is an extraordinary athlete and probably even a more extraordinary person. So, I mean, the fact that she was able to function and even coming back another year, I, I, I think that that's testimony of how extraordinary she really is. But a lot of these guys, you know, society is not going to let them cry. Let me ask you, Dana, you were at Malik Seeley's funeral in the month of May. Kevin Garnett idolized Malik Seeley as, as a child. Now he was a teammate. The Timberwolves are concerned about how Kevin will deal with his death. What have they done to address those concerns? Well, I can't speak on behalf of the Timberwolves, but I can say that Kevin is, an, is another extraordinary athlete and, an, and another extraordinary person. And I think that he is surrounded by some people that care enough about him to allow him to address it. Um, you know, I, and, and I've extended myself to Kevin to, to offer that, that consoling ear for him as well. But Should the Wolves be concerned about his reaction? I think that, I think that the Wolves need to be concerned I mean, because Malik was, was a great guy. And I think that his, his loss will be felt, but it'll also be felt in, other, in the other teams that Malik played for. I mean, one of the reasons, in addition to paying my respects to the family, one of the reasons why I went was because there are so many other players that played with him that were there at the service that I wanted to offer my support to. Jeffrey Bodine, is death a topic of conversation among NASCAR drivers, particularly in the light of the two deaths this year? Well, you know, naturally we all know that can occur in this business. We've seen um, uh, several of our friends uh, lose their lives in auto racing and, you know, we're still grieving uh, Adam's death, we're still dr grieving Kenny's death, uh, and we do remember. Uh, we have uh, numbers we put on the side of our cars to, uh, in memorial of these two fellas. Uh, we have a uh, motor racing outreach, uh, MRO, is a uh, church service for us, a counseling service uh, that, that goes around to all our races. They're actually worldwide, they're in many forms of motor racing, and uh, 
they work off of, of donations. So, and, and race drivers, the racing community, race fans all do support that, that Jeffrey, service. And uh, Jeffrey, we're going to have to end it there. I want to thank you, and I want to thank Van Chancellor and Dana London, all for joining us this morning on Outside the Lines. We'll return after this short commercial break. It's Honda's Red Hot Summer. The best time to ride is the best time to buy. Because from now until the end of August, you can ride off with low 5.9% finance on all Valkyries and Goldwings. Low payments on Shadows, Valkyrie, Rebel, and Magna. It's easy with your Honda card. And both offers let you ride off with no down payment. And now get 200 Honda bonus bucks with any Shadow VLX A750 or Rebel. Honda's Red Hot Summer. It's the sales event of the year. I should drop. To ride off of something and free fall to the ground. Let's do it. A 540 degree turn performed on a ramp. No grind. Same as a grind, but on the front truck. August 19th. August 19th is the day for fun. August 19th, the X Games on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN2. Sponsored by Taco Bell. Love chalupas? It's time to load up on your favorite crispy, chewy, big, and beefy chalupas, because right now, for a limited time, all beef chalupas are just 99 cents. That's right, your choice of Supreme, Nacho Cheese, Santa Fe, or Baja for just 99 cents. How many can you eat? Hello, friend. Chalupas, now just 99 cents. OTL is online at ESPN.com. Type in the keyword OTL Weekly at our site. You can email us, review our library of transcripts from prior shows, and even watch streaming video of previous programs. Our address again, OTL Weekly at ESPN.com. Outside the Lines is presented by 1-800-CALL-ATT for collect calls. Zero fire you, stranger. Dial 1 800 call ATT. And you can save big bucks. All you have to do is dial right down the center. Hey, right down the center. What? Hey, who it is? C A L L A T T. It's always the same low rate. Great, right? Ah! Copy. Collect. So call. Do it. I did. For the same low rate, every minute, everywhere. Dial 1 800 call ATT for collect calls. Office Maxims from Office Max. At Office Max, we know what it takes to succeed, and we've got it, all at guaranteed low prices. Over 1,000 superstores and over 30,000 items online. Office Max, you supply the ambition, we'll supply everything else. Hey, what's up, Tony? Hey, Stu. How you doing? Is there a lot of security around here? Yeah, I mean, what do you mean? Well, you know, security guard. Outside the Lines is a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Thanks for watching Outside the Lines. Coming up, Sports Center, which focuses on Mets, Diamondbacks, and other contenders going head to head. Also, there's preseason NFL highlights. And remember to join us tonight at 8 as first place clubs meet at Bush. It's the rubber game between the Cardinals and the Braves. Join us again next week, Outside the Lines.